did I tell you the, the breakdown of like the countries that we've had listens from? No. Canada, the US, Romania, Russia, the UK, Austria, Belgium, Italy, and Honduras. I think this is telling us more about people's VPNs. <laughs> The New Brunswick Archaeology Podcast, featuring Gabe Ryan and Ken Holden. Welcome back to the New Brunswick Archaeology Podcast. I'm Gabe Reinick, and I'm joined, as always, by Ken Holyoke in Lethbridge, Alberta. Uh, how are you, Ken? Not too bad. Broadcasting Good. live overlooking the coulee here in uh, beautiful Lethbridge. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, it's, it's something like 30 below here, um, Fahrenheit, Celsius. It really doesn't matter. It's the kind of nose hair freezing thing that makes a man really glad he works in this part of the world. Yeah, um, it'll be 10 degrees here tomorrow with the wind. Yeah, the, uh, and I also should apologize to the listener. My, my voice is a little off. I, I don't have COVID if, if you're worried. Um, but the optimistic spin I've tried to put on this is that the first archaeology that we're going to talk about in New Brunswick took place in 1797. Uh, and if it was back there, I'd be really worried because life expectancy was 38. So, so, but, I, but I think I'm probably not on death's door now quite yet. Um, We've got a couple of housekeeping notes. The, the first is that we've got great response uh, and some friends have provided some music for our intro and for our hit pieces. So Justin Hankey, who you can find his work at justinthelibrarian.com, will be providing the uh, intro outro music. And Shane Dahl will be providing the music for the hit pieces. And in addition to that, we have our first sponsor. And that is the Association of Professional Archaeologists of New Brunswick, an organization of which Ken and I are both members, they can be contacted at apanb.ca. And, and one of the things that we should highlight is an APANB membership gets you 35% off of a Register of Professional Archaeologists membership. So you really can't afford not to join. Is there anything else that the listeners should know about the APANB, Ken? Uh, we do, we play a role in uh, public education, um, and uh, we do have uh, a mandate to do some lobbying with government, um, and we've done that in the past, but uh, we also sponsor a speaker series uh, each year, and uh, um, we, we have upcoming speakers probably later this spring, um, and uh, uh, lots more to announce in the coming months. Fantastic, so stay tuned to that website, and we will also try to remind you about events on this podcast. So, so Ken, uh, walk us through. We've got some some exciting news uh, about the podcast. Could you could you catch us up on developments? I want to uh, extend a thanks to the uh, uh, the hundreds of listeners that we have. Um, we we crested over 120 uh, listens. I think 122 at last glance um, from uh, from seven countries. Uh, I think uh, at, at least seven countries, or as as you indicated, maybe. Uh, six countries and, and a couple VPNs, um, but uh, well represented throughout the Northeast of the United States, all across Canada, um, many listeners from Fredericton, New Brunswick. Um, so uh, we've, got a, we've got a base of operations in Toronto, Lethbridge and Fredericton, it looks like, uh, um, and a few other sp spots uh, around, uh, uh, around New Brunswick and, and parts of the Northeast. So we wanna thank you all for listening in and uh, uh, hope you enjoy episode two. For the Fredericton readership, that's very convenient because we have not yet received a winning entrant for the opportunity to rename our podcast. So continue to send those in. Um, this, this, uh, if you're the lucky winner this week, you get to spend Valentine's Day at the Bolodrome on the north side with Ken and me, uh, enjoying a nice evening uh, of of beer and uh, bowling. And and I I think they they. They've gotten rid of that thing that huffed up all the cigarette smoke and and cleared it away. I think there's been a, there's been a reform, but uh, really not to be missed. So send in those entries uh, as you as you are able. And Ken, what's the email address that they should use for that? Unless they've decided to write the lucky entry on the outside. Uh, I believe I believe we can be reached money. at New Brunswick Archaeology at Gmail .com. Amazing that that wasn't taken. That is actually pretty amazing. So what we're going to talk about today is summarizing the history of archaeological research in New Brunswick. And part of the reason that uh, it's important to think about this is that this is a David Black line that I, I always like, uh, archaeology as an inventory science, that this is something that's accumulating information through time. And so we want to think about 
the kinds of archaeological research that's gone before us. And in particular, we want to think about the context of that archaeological research because it affects what kind of questions people ask. It affects what kind of interpretations people make about what they're finding in the archaeological record. <clears throat> and it affects the sort of attitudes that people have about the people they're researching. And so archaeology speaks to these broader interdisciplinary theoretical trends that we'll unpack a little bit here. And so, so Ken, one of the things that, that you work on, which we talked about uh, at length last episode, is you work on the Washtenaw Clay church source. And church is a type of stone material that people use to make tools. And there's an important historic component to that research. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, so the, the church source itself was um, discovered by geologists in the um, in the mid 19th century, kind of described from a geological perspective by uh, uh, Loring Bailey and um, um, uh, Abraham Gesner, um, and uh, later on in the 18, uh, I think it was 1888 or 1890, um, George Matthew, who was a geologist with the um, Geological Survey of Canada. Um, uh, rediscovered the outcrop location um, on Bellier's Cove at uh, on Washtenaw Lake, and and uh, not just described the geology, but um, offered an archaeological description of it. In fact, the article I think is called the Stone Age um, Stone Age site in in southern New Brunswick. Or uh, I, I don't have the title off the top of my tongue here, but um, he described what he believed was a workshop, a lithic workshop, basically, so a place where people were breaking down stone tools. And importantly, he actually. Um, associated the the geological context with uh, indigenous people um, of the region and uh, and suspected that the stone tools he was finding were uh, ones that they had made sometime in the past um, and and fairly deep in the past too. And so that's one of the themes we discussed last week is this great substantial time depth of indigenous people here in New Brunswick. And the connection to my work um, in the sort of history of archaeology is also through GF Matthew. I work on dong features, and in 1883, G.F. Matthew, along with the Natural History Society of New Brunswick, took a field trip to Bokebeck and excavated what he called the Stone Age village of Bokebeck. And what's important about that is that Bruce Trigger, who's the, he's the probably the most important Canadian archaeologist ever. I think that's, that's I, I think that's pretty fair, fair to say. say. Yeah. Yeah. There's very few people actually you could probably see history of archaeological thought on, on the shelf behind me and probably somewhere behind you too. Yes, yeah, yeah, you can. Um, and Bruce Trigger described Matthew's work at Bokebeck, which he published in 1884 in the Bulletin of the Natural History Society of New Brunswick as the best archaeological research from the coast that had been published in North America up to that point. So we're already, I hope, kind of dispelling one of the myths that I think sometimes people have about this region, which is that it's kind of always been a backwater which is just not true in the intellectual history of the region. So let's start though at the, at the kind of beginning of North American archeology. span And so in 1784, Thomas Jefferson, who's sometimes probably kind of generously described as the father of American archeology, span um, has his slaves loot a burial mound in Virginia in, uh, and that's in 1784. But archeology span in New Brunswick starts um, really only about a decade or a little bit more after that. In 1797, it turned out that in the Treaty of Paris, the folks who were making the maps weren't very good at it. And so as a result, the international border um, onto what was then between uh, the United States, uh, so Massachusetts and Nova Scotia, it wasn't exactly clear what river the Treaty of Paris referred to. But it was clear that the St. Croix River had had Champlain's very ill-fated uh, habitation in the early 1600s there. So that meant that if someone could find the archeological remains of Champlain's habitation there, that they would know which river was referred to to create the international boundary. And that was undertaken by a fellow named Thomas Wright and Robert Pagan. And uh, much to, I think, probably Pagan's relief since he was a loyalist, he discovered that St. Andrews was in fact in Canada. I imagine, I imagine that was, uh, a bit of a yeah, relief. Yeah. yeah, out there maybe sprinkling St. Ange pottery, you know, around uh, the Mega David River. You know. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so we've got this really early beginning in New Brunswick archaeology, and that fits into what William Sabloff called the speculative 
period. And so Willie and Savlov have divided broad intellectual trends in the archaeology of North America that sometimes New Brunswick archaeology works with, and sometimes it's really been distinct from. Yeah. And so, uh, Ken, did you want to sort of summarize the speculative period? Um, basically, these are um, uh, mostly people who are not trained in archaeology, antiquarians, um, people kind of fascinated with the past, but with no real formal training in archaeology, um, you know, within the discipline more broadly, uh, hadn't really sorted out ways to sort of systematically excavate archaeological sites. So people were finding things and were interested in them, um, but really uh, uh, there wasn't any kind of focused research or, or questions being asked about archaeology, just a, kind of a fascination with the past. Um, and, and, you know, it coincides with sort of this growing national identity with, within both, uh, with, within the United States in particular, um, uh, after their independence from, from the uh, United Kingdom, and then, um, and really sort of the early days of, of uh, uh, British North America as well, so. And so more locally, we might think of this as the naturalist period or the natural um, history period, because these guys are, as you say, engaged in um, really a wide range of intellectual endeavor. So you mentioned uh, Abraham Gesner. Am, am I right that Abraham Gesner also invented kerosene? Really? Oh, that, you know, actually, that probably does make sense. Um, oh, like, I, I feel like, there, you know, there's probably a few claims. to. I, I don't know that off the top of my head, though. I mean, it uh, would make sense. He worked in like the coal, coal fields of uh, sort of central, south central New Brunswick and um, would have been involved in that. Could be wrong about this. I, I would encourage the listener not to fact check that too closely, but <laughs> the uh, but I think he invented the kerosene and and um and archaeology actually composed a fairly small amount of of GF Matthews research, an important amount, but he's very interested in biology and geology, and really all these guys were. Yeah. And one of the largest also- one of the largest trilobite fossils uh uh in like North America, uh on the shores of St. John uh and the St. John Harbor. Oh, that's right, yeah. And most of the um, writing about Matthew deals with the famous trilobites. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Uh, and so in addition to that, you've got a, a kind of interesting dynamic where these guys aren't doing archaeology or even really intellectual pursuits as their day job. So uh, Matthew's the customs inspector at St. John Harbor. And what that does, again, speaking to this lack of insularity, I think that is was present in the 1800s in New Brunswick archaeological research, one of the things that appears that Matthew really used that position to do was to make sure that there were plenty of books and specimens and letters and these kinds of things coming over from Europe so that the folks at the Natural History Society were staying in touch with the latest, the latest uh, continental trends. And so we've got these, uh, these kind of developments. And this is uh, overlapping then by about 1850 with what Willie and Sabloth call the classificatory descriptive period, which they say goes from about 1840 to 1914. And Ken, some of your, uh, this starts to overlap with a kind of the end of what, correct me if I'm wrong, but I would say it would be fair to say that the early 1900s are kind of the end of the golden years of early New Brunswick archeology. span yeah, and, and kind of that first wave of, of uh, you have sort of um, uh, Matthew, you've got uh, uh, William Ganong, uh, W.F. Ganong, um, and the famous Ganong map, uh, writing the first sort of like comprehensive monograph on New Brunswick history, um, uh, historic, uh, historic sites in the province of New Brunswick, I believe is the title, uh, 1899. Um, and, and there's basically on the back end of this, uh, a real pause for almost a, a decade and a half, really, um, until the mid 60s, when things start to pick up again. Um, and what had happened during this period, though, too, is that New Brunswick became integrated into a much broader archaeology in North America and kind of was was being, like you said, there were letters being exchanged with people in England, but also um, these bulletins of like the Natural History Society were being read very widely, like this wasn't just an insular group. Um, these sort of um, narratives about archaeology were getting out uh, more broadly, like, uh, and bringing people like W.K. Moorhead up into the region, too. Yeah, so um, there's two things you brought up that I was just flipping through the uh, the New Brunswick podcaster handbook before we went on, and apparently I'm obligated, if you mentioned the Ganong map, to ask you about the Ganong map. Uh, well, so the Ganong map, it's actually hanging in my office here. 
uh, a fairly famous uh, uh, sort of cartographic uh, depiction of um, uh, people's places, uh, particularly focused on the indigenous occupation of New Brunswick, um, that uh, uses a number of toponymical, um, so place names uh, in uh, Wolastigwig or Mi'kmaq um, uh, to describe uh, the various rivers throughout the province. Um, it shows major river systems that indigenous groups would have moved along uh, canoe and port, uh, canoe routes. Uh, and uh, uh, I, the map is itself is actually called Aboriginal Canoe and Portage Routes. Um, and along with these canoe routes, uh, Ganong had done a bunch of research about traditional travel routes, so overland travel routes between some of these river systems, um, which he describes in some detail uh, in the book itself. Um, and he notes in a number of places on the map um, uh, where uh, particular archaeological sites or campsites might have been located. Um, uh, and, it, and it became important for um, documenting a lot of these portage routes that would have probably been lost to a certain degree um, or that, uh, that uh, required somebody to document and, and kind of push forward. Um, but it also, um, he makes a point of sort of describing Indigenous spaces as well, and so he sort of casts broadly where um, uh, Pescamacati or Passamaquoddy groups, Maliseet or Wolastaquid groups, and Mi'kmaq or Mi'kmaq groups were in the province, um, at least at the time of writing, and, uh, um, and, and it's become a bit controversial in some ways too. Yes, I was going to ask you, so the, the listeners should be, should be careful about projecting that understanding of territoriality into the past. Yeah. And, and, um, and, and in particular, because um, in some, and I think in the original depiction, he actually draws a line between these territories, whereas some of the reproductions um, have, have cleverly removed those lines um, and probably for the best. Yeah, that was my understanding as well. And I suspect probably uh, later in, in this season, we'll talk more about the uh, ways in which archaeologists try to study territoriality, contact period, and understanding of territoriality. Um, it's one of the, um, you know, it, I always think of that as there, there can be things that are exciting, and they're exciting because they're fun. And then there can be things that are exciting because they're not fun, and they're also really complicated. And I would say territoriality falls into the latter category. Territoriality and population dynamics are not things that, that cheer me up. No, and, uh, and, and are politically, um, have a political, political weight to them uh, in today's, today's world. Precisely, yeah. yeah. Um, so we brought the listener up. You mentioned then Warren King Moorhead. And this is an important, uh, it's a great name for one. And the, I have uh, an interesting experience in that I, I regularly uh, do, do archival research at the Robert S. Peabody Institute in Andover, Massachusetts. It's at Phillips Andover Academy. And that museum is closely associated with Warren Moorhead, who is described uh, often as the Dean of American Archaeology. Moorhead's connection, though, in Maine, and he authored the uh, Archaeology of Maine in 1922, which includes some of the archaeology of New Brunswick, thereby, I think, starting a long trend of that sort of thing. Uh, you know, we'll just duck over the border and dig up, you know, but he didn't find much in New Brunswick. Um, no, trowel, trowel wasn't big enough. Yeah, exactly. And um, Moorhead's a complicated guy. And, and Moorhead, his contemporary politics, if you can call them that, were actually fairly progressive with regard to concern about indigenous people. But his actual archaeological research was not consistent with what we would do now. He basically ran around Maine digging up uh, what he called red paint, we would now call maritime archaic burials of indigenous people. And along with this, he, he did this in, there's some you know unsavory parts of this too. His group was called the Force. He had this huge uh, trowel that at least in the pictures is like the size of an iPad. You know, he uh, basically is just, you know, ripping apart sites to get to these very elaborate burials. And I, I should say, as a result, actually, the Robert S. Peabody Institute became a real leader in NAGPRA, which is the Native American Graves Protection Repatriation Act down in the States, to deal with this. So this is the kind of scale of the problem. But during this period, Moorhead also um, ducks across the border in New Brunswick uh, 
I believe he follows the Rustic River to about Woodstock. Says, oh, I've had enough. Heads back to Maine. Uh, and continues arguably what I think is one of the most interesting aspects of him. And this is an argument not original to me. I think it's Art's piece. That he, in some ways, is the, the kind of father of cultural resource management, too. He's basically designing predictive models to find sites. And he's also very interested in site density and site priority. You know, he'll decide not enough red paint burials in this area. We're going to move on. So he's interested in, in rather than on the objects themselves and site density. So that's, that's Moorhead. And coming out of 1922, when Moorhead publishes that, I think, and, and stop me, Ken, if I, if I miss something important here, it makes sense to think globally for a minute and talk about 1949, which is where Willard Libby invents radiocarbon dating. And you're teaching intro right now. Would you like to explain radiocarbon dating to the listener? Well, uh, it's a, uh, basically this is a process where we can, we have determined that you can measure the amount of uh, a carbon isotope called C14 uh, in the atmosphere uh, and in the world in general through time. Uh, and various dating techniques had been developed in the early 1900s, one of them in particular dendrochronology, which is using tree rings to date sites. Um, uh, Libby figured out that uh, as organisms decay, they release, um, there is a change from carbon-14 to carbon-13. Am I, am I still on the right track here? Uh, that's that's well, not- As far as track. I know, I don't, yeah. I always have to look this up. Um, and you can, uh, you can actually measure the amount of carbon-14 in this decayed organism uh, because when it passes on, uh, it's sort of a, a stable amount and you can compare it to the amount of carbon-14 in the atmosphere now. You can figure out basically how old that organic matter is. And so if it's a bone or a piece of charcoal from an archaeological site, what you're dating is essentially the moment of death of that organism. Um, this is great if you have somebody building um, a fire out of uh, wood they just chopped down. It's really problematic in places like Labrador where you're using wood, driftwood that's been floating um, or like sat up on the shoreline for a couple thousand years uh, and then burning it because what you're dating is the day or the, the time that that tree died as opposed to when that fire was made. Um, and uh, I, I think that's the gist of it. There, there's yeah. it, AMS dating is like a new version of radiocarbon dating. Yeah. Um, but, but what it allowed us to do was date archaeological contexts um, in a way that didn't rely on particular artifacts found in particular stratigraphic contexts. That was still important, but it was a lot, it allowed us to put a calendar date or a, a specific um, absolute date associated with a particular archaeological context, which was a, a, a major shift in the way we understood archaeological time, a lot more precision. Yeah. So prior to 49, there's big advancements in, in figuring out time by comparing uh, artifact typologies, stratigraphic layers. And in particular, one of the things that people were doing were finding fluted points, which are the oldest kinds of projectile points in North America, in association with Pleistocene megafauna, you know. So like in the in the battle <laughs> days, if you've been driving a you know a Volkswagen around the Southwest or something, and uh, you know, it wouldn't be enough to wrap your Volkswagen around a bison. It would be a bison antiquist, which is like, you know, the biggest bison you can you can imagine. And so people found these associations and could say, yeah, people have been here since the last ice age. But actually pinning down that date was facilitated by radiocarbon dating. And we should say that it wasn't like this was overnight. It wasn't like 1949, all of a sudden, this technique worked really, really well. Um, this technique's gotten better in our careers, Yep. both in terms of the small amount of material you can date um, and the sophistication with which you can model those dates to get better um, answers about the age. Because one thing we should note is that what it's actually producing the model, and, and we don't need to get in the weeds on this, but it's producing a statistical estimate. Um, and that introduces some real challenges to this. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that radiocarbon ages are different than calendar ages as well. So, um, you know, there's, a, there's another statistical calculation that you do over and above this radiocarbon date to get out what the calendar date is. And so radiocarbon dates and calendar dates are roughly around the same to up to about 2,000 to 3,000 years ago. And then they start to diverge from one another to the point that like, 10,000 radiocarbon years is actually around 12,500 calendar years ago. 
So the Paleo-Indian period, if you see a date that says 10,000 years ago, it's probably in radiocarbon years uh, because Paleo-Indian is probably more likely 12,500 calendar years. Um, but the real tricky thing is sometimes authors don't, uh, don't make it clear when they're using radiocarbon dates and whether they're using calendar dates or um, how they calibrated those dates. Um, and we should and say that uh, New Brunswick, Maine, Nova Scotia are actually probably the worst places for this in which people are very unclear about whether you're looking at calibrated dates, uncalibrated dates. Yeah. Um, and a dearth uh, of dates. Is it Adrian Burke that talks about progressively fewer radiocarbon dates as you head east? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's really, really interesting. Um, and so now, you know, I, I just like people ask me about this sometimes. So I'm, I'm going to just say this here. And so the, um, one of the innovations now about dates is that they actually are not very expensive by the standards of highfalutin scientific research. The, uh, the, I would say it's the kind of gourmet radiocarbon lab, which is in Florida called Beta. If they'd love to sponsor, that'd be great. Um, they'll run a, a, a kind of high-end date with all sorts of modeling for about 600 American dollars or you know 8,000 Canadian dollars. And, but you can get dates much cheaper. And so what a result, the result of that is you can explain to your granting agency that, you know, how, I don't know how many dates you built into like your winter grant, but something like 10. Uh, I think it was like three or four. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Three or four. It was, that was a hopeful three or four. That was sure. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. You're on the interior. So there's less to date. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, Ken, Ken and I, you know, as just since we're, we're airing the, the trouble we've had, we've, uh, we've, we've certainly run radiocarbon dates and, thought we'd screwed something up. And now that we've revisited them with a little bit more savvy, have thought that what we actually screwed up was thinking screwing, screwing them up. Um, it was which, the act of what we submitted that was uh, was probably not worth. We, we flushed some money down the toilet on uh, uh, just maybe not doing the detailed research on. And that's a lesson to you all. If you're going to run a radiocarbon date uh, uh, and spend the money uh, to uh, make sure you're dating the right thing. Yeah. It's, it's an incredibly powerful tool and, uh, you know, with great power comes great responsibility <laughs> and the, the misuses of absolute dates are, are myriad and you should always be, be checking yourself against this. Um, so uh, are we, uh, do you think we're at uh, George Frederick Clark now? Is that, is that where we are? Yeah, I, like uh, uh, we, we've, we've sort of jumped a little bit from like 1900 up into the 1960s, but I think what's important to kind of take away is that a lot of what was going on in that early period and uh, was, you know, it was a lot of these natural history societies, there were like field trips going on that the, um, the New Brunswick Natural History Society, for example, sponsored. So they basically take like busloads of people out to um, dig up archaeological sites um, and would publish on, you know, uh, with, with, sort of, you know, great vigor about uh, how excited everyone was and how everyone went home with artifacts in their pockets. And um, and this is particularly problematic because um, there's a significant portion of the archaeological record that was um, sort of subject to ad hoc excavation during that time period um, that we've lost information on um, because, you know, these were, these, these activities weren't viewed as problematic. Um, there was a research enterprise going along with them. So there were representatives from the museums that were going out to do research work, um, but the public participated in them. And although it was an opportunity to teach people about the past in the province, um, uh, the retention of those artifacts uh, and the treatment of them and, you know, the lack of curation with some of them um, has resulted in a real significant loss of information. I mean, there's this fantastic um, panoramic photo of actually of a collection at the New Brunswick Museum, um, probably in the early like nineteen like nineteen twenties or whatever, um, this sort of panoramic image of a of a of a display case of artifacts, um, which to my knowledge have sort of disappeared uh, sometime in the in the intervening years. Yeah, there's a fair amount of that uh, has occurred at, at various places that that artifacts have disappeared, and, and that's problematic because we want to think about this as when you dig an archaeological site, and this is, you know, why there are opportunities, if you're interested in archaeology, the best way to get involved is to join a field school, you know, and, and, and these kinds of things. There are opportunities to be involved in professional archaeology, which we would encourage you all to pursue if you're interested in that. But is that when you remove uh, artifacts, it's not really the artifacts that tell you the whole story. They're a small part of the story. 
And it's the context of those artifacts. So just yeah. like we were talking about finding these particular kinds of projectile points in the ribs of a particular kind of bison, you know, people had found old bison and they'd found old projectile points before. It's the association of those two that permits you to say, oh, wow, you know, people have been here for a really long time. So amid, uh, and Clark's an interesting character who we could probably do a whole episode on. Uh, yeah, yeah, I season. would imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I would, uh, we have an affinity for, for Clark because his collection is curated here at the University of New Brunswick. And so as a result, uh, UNB has had kind of a, a long relationship facilitated by Dave Black with the family, with the collection, and a lot of master's thesis um, work has involved that collection. And so um, Clark is a dentist, and also before that, he was a hypnotist. I didn't and, know that. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, this is how he paid his way through dental school, is my understanding. Interesting. Yeah. Um, and But he's primarily really known, I think, in New Brunswick as a writer. Would you say that's... Yeah, uh, children's stories and stories about fishing and um, some histories. Uh, the, the book on uh, the Acadians uh, is, is pretty interesting and, and, and his archaeological writing, of course. And, and this archaeological writing culminates in a book called Someone Before Us in 1968. And at, at that moment, right, at 1968, I think you would probably say that Clark's work was the most exhaustive treatment of a region in the province. Do you think that's fair? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it remains really one of the more, more most comprehensive sort of assessments of the middle of Velastog. So like the, the middle reaches of the St. John River, particularly between um, where the present day Mactaquac Dam is located and, and sort of Grand Falls, basically. Um, um, that's where he, he did most of his collecting and, and the archaeology that he knew um, uh, most well. And, and that in the southwest Miramichi, I suppose, like in around the Miramichi River districts. And the Mactaquac Dam is part of why there ain't going to be any more archaeology in a exactly. large part of where he was working. So he's yeah. really the last remnant, um, last opportunity to do any archaeological work um, in that area. <clears throat> People who um, are particularly uh, tapped into uh, New Brunswick, I, I guess you'd sort of say ethno history or kind of New Brunswickana, these kinds of things, will also know, might know the name Tappan Adney who is uh, uh, almost impossible to describe, actually. Um, <laughs> a, a talker of squirrels, uh, a, a lawyer, a naturalist. Writer, journalist. Yeah. Um, uh, a lunatic, he seems like. <laughs> and, um, but, but also sort of brilliant, I would say. And, and is often at loggerheads with Clark. They have... Uh, um, I think I think one of the MA students once described them as frenemies, right? Yeah. They they are simultaneously impressed by one another and condescending to one another and convinced the other is going about things in the wrong way, you know, with with Adney's really linguistic and historical focus, Clark's archaeological focus, these do not always merge very well. And it's it's an interesting chapter in New Brunswick archaeology. So 68 is an interesting time in archaeology in North America because in 1966, we get the first, it was, it's not, I guess, the first, but we get perhaps the most important piece of heritage legislation um, out of the United States, which is the National Historic Preservation Act. Yeah. And this is stuff you understand much better than I do, Ken, particularly as it relates to New Brunswick. Yeah. And so the National Historic Preservation Act um, basically introduced and prescribed a process for um, documenting um, and describing uh, and uh, uh, nominating for uh, uh, sort of describing as significant archaeological sites um, in the United States, particularly focused on projects that received funding from the federal government or were taking place on federal lands. Um, and this was taking place, you know, in the context of um, uh, sort of a North American trend uh, towards sort of environmental concerns. Um, a lot of post-World War development was going on, um, and rightly so, um, uh, archaeologists and heritage professionals in the United States sort of raised 
Although they had existing legislation, they raised concerns about the influx of industrial expansion and development um, as, uh, as threatening to archaeological resources. And the NHPA um, uh, sort of codified under its Section 106 a process for how um, uh, you document and nominate archaeological sites or, or historic places more generally um, for register on the, I think it's the National Register um, in the yeah, United States. Places, yeah. And uh, um, and really launched uh, the, the modern day CRM industry uh, in North America as a result. Um, and, and Canada was a bit of a laggard in this regard. Um, and while the same levels of development were going on, there wasn't as much of a push towards uh, legislation at that time. Um, although J.V. Wright, uh, at the, the first inaugural meeting of the Canadian Archaeological Association in, in 1969, uh, has this uh, really fantastic presidential address that is kind of like a rallying cry for, for archaeology to all, you know, what is it that, that the all of the archaeologists in, in Canada could fit in a car um, at that time, and, and usually they were traveling together or something. Uh, this is a line like that. Yeah, it's something like that, yeah. <laughs> But uh, but so this is going on in the states that they're codifying um, that uh, uh, when development is happening, archaeological work needs to happen um, to basically document um, and prevent destruction of the archaeological sites in the path of maybe a new highway or a, a, a hydroelectric dam, for example. And uh, and flashing back to New Brunswick, um, we also have at that time um, the motivation of the provincial government to essentially build a number of hydroelectric dams uh, in the province and and uh, and Clark sort of at the crosshairs of that. And there's a key difference in how regular, I guess we'll call it regulatory or cultural resource management legislation evolves here in New Brunswick, right? And, and that is that, or in Canada, which is that it's at the provincial level rather than primarily in response to a federal mandate. Yeah. Um, so, We've now kind of moved into this professional, this professional era of archaeology in the region. And so we can we can kind of gloss this in a couple of of I guess key events, right? Or key institutions, maybe. So David Sanger gets hired at what's now the Canadian Museum of History. And also, Richard Pearson begins doing archaeological research in the area, and they focus on Passamaquoddy Bay. Yeah, and and for context too, uh, J.V. Wright's rallying cry precipitated what became the Archaeological Survey of Canada, and Sanger and Pearson were both hired as were like a, among the people that were sent out from the ASC across Canada to document uh, uh, significant Indigenous archaeological sites or survey significant regions prior to um, sort of, they, they called it salvage archaeology, basically, um, to, to salvage sites and to identify sites potentially under threat of, of being uh, bulldozed. Yeah, or eroded as well. Or eroded, yeah. Yeah. Um, and in, is it 1971 that Chris Turnbull was hired as the first provincial archaeologist here in New Brunswick? Yeah, I think so. And, and what does that role entail? Um, so he's basically hired as a... a Kind of a manager of uh, archaeological resources. He's meant to promote uh, education and uh, um, develop a process for um, salvage archaeology or, or impact assessment archaeology, I guess, before it was called that, um, but also um, to collaborate with researchers and to sort of build the profile of, of New Brunswick archaeology alongside how you regulate New Brunswick archaeology, basically. So kind of a hub of everything, because we didn't have a we don't have a research museum that had an archaeological branch. Turnbull went on to be uh, an important, I would say, intellectual presence in the development of cultural resource management um, in Canada, and probably yeah. wasn't listened to as much as he should have been. Yeah, and, and wrote this very prescient paper in 1977 called A Backdirt and Bureaucracy, um, where he sort of, um, he's recognized he's a few years into his job, and he's recognized that um, these government offices, the provincial branches that are sprung up across Canada um, in each of the provinces, and I think at least the Northwest Territories by then. Um, uh, and what he realized was that as, as government archaeologists and working in the capacity that they were, um, they were, he, he raised concerns about uh, 
the inc increasing bureaucratization of that uh, uh, of that position. Um, uh, Josh Dent more recently has has come up with a very eloquent term called the archaeo bureaucrat. Um, and basically that these positions were um, at risk of becoming highly politicized because of the interaction of the government uh, branch and uh, government, you know, uh, development projects, or even, you know, projects that would be benefit of the province. Um, and then, you know, having a government employee that may or may not have the ability to uh, critique uh, government actions or, or uh, weigh in on a project particularly. Um, so they, they had become involved in a political process in some ways. Great. And this is all coming out of a broader theoretical interest in archaeology and anthropological archaeology in general, too, which is that there's a newfound focus facilitated in large part by radiocarbon dates on what somewhat preciously people like Lou Binford call explanation, right? They say, oh, we're not just going to put things in order. We're going to tell you about human behavior. One thing that's interesting is this region Maine and the Maritimes essentially opts out of that theoretical movement until about the 1980s. And then I, I think the version of it applied by David Black in the Quadi region is much more complicated. I, I don't think you'd call that kind of straight processualism. It's kind of no. theoretically unique. Yeah. And I mean, he Dave almost kind of is a precursor to historic processualism in many ways, right? Like he's you know, he's he's contextualizing things with a history beyond just sort of a cultural ecological model. Um, yeah, I think that's right. And, he's and model ways, building, but but in a different way than than Binford envisioned it, I think. Yeah, and in many ways drawing on the, I think, approach of the natural historians, right? I think uh, you can see a lot of that in some of his work and on, on kind of allied sciences, right? Geologists, that kind of thing. Yeah. But... The current remains certainly, I mean, arguably to today on, on culture history, on putting things in order in the region. So um, we're not quite to the half empty bottle of Covassier yet, but I think we're sort of at the at the tie things together and get into our hit pieces, right? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think we, we, we've got up to sort of the mid 1980s. We've sort of introduced Dave Black. Um, and, and I think... Um, it's important to understand that sort of uh, uh, the changes that have gone on since the early to mid eighties. Um, and we've talked about cultural resource management a little bit and how that had its sort of nascency in the 1960s in the, in the United States um, and kind of was formalized to a certain degree in New Brunswick in the 1970s with the hiring of Chris Turnbull, but really became uh, an industry uh, in the late eighties uh, with uh, the government of New Brunswick passing the um, Clean Environment Act, um, which basically spelled out the environmental impact assessment process uh, in New Brunswick. Um, and throughout the 1990s, what we saw is the real formalization of the cultural resource management industry in New Brunswick, in that you had companies, uh, multi service environmental consulting companies, um, hiring archaeologists for big projects. I think probably the biggest profile CRM program in the 90s was the Gemse Crossing Archaeological Project, um, and a very highly visible project, um, some big successes, uh, and also, um, you know, not without its own controversies. And, and, uh, and I think it really sort of put to the forefront the challenges that CRM was going to have, um, uh, and still has today, in negotiating um, uh, political and development concerns, uh, Indigenous concerns about archaeology, um, and the relationship between academic, government, and and private sector archaeologists, and you know some of the approaches to sort of working together that have um, have some of which has been carried forward, and some of which has not, and and uh, and and then throughout the '90s and early 2000s, I think you really see this shift um, in the way that people are doing archaeology in, in New Brunswick toward toward that CRM um, um, enterprise sort of taking over the bulk of the work. Um, uh, leading up to really even even today, uh, and this is characteristic of most of North America now. And I think we're, we're sort of foreshadowing a little bit talking about Gemsig, which was a gigantic um, collaborative archaeology project. You know, one of the the first really of its kind that uh, included indigenous people um, in a in a serious collaborative way. Uh, again, as you mentioned, not without 
not without controversy and challenge, but and, and also produce two volumes about the work, which yeah, yeah, um, and pushed out publication was co-management with Indigenous community members, a huge education component, um, you know, and I and I think you're right that it truly collaborative is what uh, what it was, and 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 I think even today we're still trying to figure out how to make that sort of model work um, in CRM, and I think it's kind of one of the big challenges in CRM today. I think that's right. I think it's possible to certainly to imagine a very different archaeology emerging out of GEMSEG. Yeah. Um, well, I think uh, we are on to our hit pieces, Ken. Yeah. Okay. Uh, is, was there anything else? Were there any take home points you wanted to uh, to add here? I will tell the the listener that uh, if they're looking for a very detailed account, um, uh, a very new account, uh, uh, Matthew uh, Betts and, and Gabe Reinick uh, are co-host here, uh, um, have a great chapter in the introduction of the archaeology of the Atlantic Northeast that highlights um, the history of uh, archaeology in New Brunswick and sort of um, kind of pulls out some of the, the stuff that we hinted on uh, throughout this. And, and uh, if we've got space in the show notes, we'll, we'll throw a few of the items that we talked about uh, and maybe we'll, we'll prepare a more uh, detailed uh, page for people to visit um, for some of the stuff we can't fit in the show notes. We're, we're we're hampered by a, a character count that uh, um, I guess on your cell phone, you can't read uh, three or four pages of, of show notes. Yeah. Well, well, thank you, Ken. I appreciate that. But I'll, yeah, uh, Ken's alluding to the housekeeping problem where we were off by one zero on how long we thought the, the show <laughs> notes could be. So we urgently were, were arranging them. Um, and many of these topics we hope to revisit in future episodes. Why don't you take the first hit note, Ken? Hit piece, okay. rather. So um, we've got the first one here is basically talking about, um, uh, Gabe alluded to the fact that in Canada, we don't have this overarching federal legislation um, like they do in the United States. Um, uh, we have provincial, each province and each territory have their own uh, heritage acts. Um, in New Brunswick, it's called the Heritage Conservation Act. It was introduced in 2010. Um, it updated, I think, what was called the Historic Places Act before that, um, much more detailed, uh, more certain, and there's sort of definitions of what an archaeological object are, what an ar archaeological object is, rather, um, uh, what archaeological sites are, what, uh, what comprises an archaeological site, how permitting is handled, um, whereas uh, we don't have this sort of overarching blanket of, of federal legislation. We've got various pieces of federal legislation that enact you know, protect archaeological sites at National Historic Sites, for example, um, to a certain degree within national parks. Um, we have legislation that uh, it's not, there's a policy called the Archaeological Heritage Policy Framework that the federal government operates under, but there's no sort of, um, uh, there's no top-down um, prescription from the federal government about how um, archaeology and heritage things are protected. However, um, in the uh, uh, the House of Commons right now uh, is uh, Bill C-23, an act respecting places, persons, and events of national historic significance or national interest, archaeological resources, and cultural and natural heritage, which shorthand is the Historic Places of Canada Act. Um, and uh, the bill has gone through second reading, is uh, my understanding, just before the holidays, um, and is in the process of probably going out to committee where it will be um, uh, a number of heritage uh, sector um, uh, groups, so, you know, the Canadian Archaeological Association, ICOMOS, and various other entities that are engaged in heritage more broadly, not just archaeology, so we're talking about historic places and other things, um, have weighed in on the legislation and provided the government with recommendations, um, and uh, it sounds like uh, the government will now take those recommendations into consideration um, and as they work through committee, which is just an internal government process, um, my understanding is that they will tweak the legislation again, and then uh, it will be presented to the House on a third reading. And if it passes third reading, it goes to the Senate. And then we may sometime in 2023, actually, before the House rises, we may actually see the first comprehensive federal heritage legislation. And it's not the same as the NHPA, but it's a it's a huge first step for, for Canada um, as the last of the, um, uh, I think, G20 nations to have federal heritage legislation uh, adopted. That's remarkable. I didn't know that about the G20. Yeah. For, um, for publications, we've got two this week. 
The first is a little bit late, um, and that is that there's a new volume of the Handbook of North American Indians. And so that's not a term we would use today, but um, the reason for this term in the publication is that the series started out of the Smithsonian Institution in the 70s and remains unfinished. The, it is an invaluable resource, and as a part of this uh, resource, what it is, is it's, it's multiple volumes, mostly sorted by region, some sorted by topic, that is a complete compendium of um, now somewhat dated, but still extremely useful information about the indigenous people of North America. I suspect I certainly turn to it frequently, Ken. You as well? Yeah. I mean, I can see it just over your right shoulder here. Yes. At least, was, a, couple of, at least a couple of the volumes. So I have a, actually a whole set uh, due, due to the, my, my mother-in-law being a, a librarian and, and helping Oh, wow. uh, helping me acquire something that were that were headed for a dumpster in in Pennsylvania. Jeez, um, tell her tell her to keep an eye out for me too. I'll mention it. Yeah, <laughs> um, and then the other publication from some colleagues of ours: Dave Leslie, Zach Singer, G. Logan Miller, uh, Katie Reinhardt, Brian Jones. And the reason I'm bringing this one up is it's an article for, about a site in Massachusetts, but it's dealing with this period that was largely discovered described for the far Northeast and that is the Gulf of Maine Archaic Traditions, which we'll talk about more in later episodes. The article is in Archaeology of Eastern North America, issue 50, uh, pages 1 to 30, and it's called The Gulf of Maine Archaic Tradition Occupations at the Edgewood Apartment Site in Plainville, Massachusetts. I also just want to emphasize that the kind of work that, that many of the guys on this, or the people on this paper have been doing, really speaks to the kinds of interesting and important research that CRM companies are doing and how important it is that groups like this are continuously publishing some of their best CRM stuff. So all the guys involved in this, uh, all the people involved in this have been just really terrific as far as the track record with that regard, always publishing interesting stuff. I look forward to reading it when I get my, uh, my AENA from Toronto. That's excellent. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I can tell uh, Gabe's uh, uh, starting to fade a little bit here, so I think we're 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 actually we are looking at the half bottle of uh, half empty bottle of Corbusier now, and and uh, uh, we want to thank everybody for listening to episode two um, and for participating in uh, the uh, the New Brunswick Archaeology podcast. I actually had somebody ask me today. Uh, we were talking. I said we started recording a podcast, and they said, "What's it called?" And I said, "It's the New Brunswick Archaeology Podcast." And they started laughing, and and uh, and I said, "Oh no, you know it's." It's a great title. It, it describes exactly what's going on. But uh, you, the listener, could be the one to uh, to give us a new name. So Valentine's uh, Day at the Bola Drum. Yeah. So from Lethbridge to uh, Romania, Italy, Honduras, Austria, United Kingdom, Russian Federation, all all across the United States and Canada, we want to thank you for listening. Um, you can subscribe to our podcast or follow us on uh, iTunes on. Uh, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, um, any others? I'm not sure. Uh, wherever fine podcasts are available, I think. The Podcast Index, Samsung podca Podcasts, yes. which I actually didn't even know there are Samsung Podcasts. I guess you can play those through your refrigerator or something. That must be it. It's It's got ice, crushed ice, cold water, and podcast. That's, uh, and so you might need to pour yourself a new one. Yeah, it's also probably been tapped into by enemy agents who are listening to your every word though so it goes right <laughs> through tiktok i think this is where we put the outro music in i think so <laughs> we'll see you next fortnight everybody yes thank you